winning a battle doesn't necessarily mean that you win a war. And in the same vein, losing a battle doesn't mean that you've lost the war. We see that very clearly in the book of Joshua. And we realize in our own lives that sin uh, is something that's always going to be with us. And we are trying to do the right thing. We're trying to win the battles of life. And there are times where we take the wrong step, that we sin against God. And if we're not careful, the enemy can convince us that it's over, that we've lost not just that battle, but we've lost the war in our walk with God. And we know that as we look in the book of Joshua, that the key to winning a battle is strategy. People understand what they need to do, but don't know how to do that. And we see that Joshua knew that he was to take the promised land, but he had a specific strategy. That strategy was very clear in that he cut a swath through the center of the land of Canaan. In other words, the first battle was on the east side of the property of the land of uh, Canaan. And he won at Jericho, lost at Ai, then came back to win it. And he went straight across to the west side of the land of Canaan. So what he did is he divided the enemy in half. And then he went south to conquer the southern portion of the land. And then he moved north and uh, finished the conquest of the land of Canaan, the promised land that was given to Israel. You know, I believe that many Christians experience defeat in their lives because they're not applying divine strategy to daily living. They're not applying divine strategy to daily living. We're using our, our, a secular strategy. We're using a humanistic strategy. We're using uh, what we believe is the best strategy to deal with the daily things of life. Now, when you think about vision, vision is simply seeing a need and its solution. That's really all vision is. That I, I see a need and I'm able to create a vision based on what that need is. Now, for some, that's very easy to do. For some, it's very hard. You know, they're the doers. They're more task-oriented. They have a hard time seeing the big picture of what things are and what things need to be. On the other hand, a visionary sometimes has a difficult time developing and implementing a strategy to accomplish the vision. That's why it's good to have a team and have people around you to complement your weaknesses and your strengths in order to accomplish the vision that God has given you for your life and for us, for the church, for the ministry, for the battle that we're in. In other words, that God wants you to have a vision and a strategy for your personal life, for your home, for your career, and for the church, for the kingdom of God and what we're trying to accomplish, the strategy that God has given you. Now, here's the problem. Satan also has a strategy. He knows what he's trying to do to undo you. And so he has a very subtle strategy. And we're going to see that in the ninth chapter of the book of Joshua. So I want you to open your Bibles there. For those who are guests, we're going through the book of Joshua. And uh, we see today there are five key elements to the strategy that Satan has and we're going to counter that with what God says is, is how we combat that strategy that Satan has in order to experience victory in our Christian life as they were trying to experience victory in accomplishing the vision that God had given in conquering the promised land. Now, I want to, I want to read the entire chapter of chapter 9 because I believe it's important to get the full context of what Satan does, okay? It, it, some of this will be very explicit, and some of it will be uh, implicit. It'll be, it'll be indirect on what Satan is doing, but you'll see it. Chapter 9, verse 1. When all the kings heard about Jericho and Ai, those battles they won, those who were west of the Jordan in the hill country, in the Judean hill, foothills, and all along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Toward Lebanon, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and all the other ites, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they acted deceptively. They gathered provisions and took worn out sacks on their donkeys, and old wineskins cracked and mended. 
They wore old patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing on their bodies. Their entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. The men of Israel replied to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us. Just to make sure you understand, the Gibeonites are the same as the Hivites. The Gibeonites live within the Hivite community. Perhaps you live among us. How can we make a treaty with you? They said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, Who are you and where do you come from? They replied to him, Your servants have come from a faraway land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt. And all that he did to the two Amorite kings beyond the Jordan, Sion king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan, who was in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our land told us, Take provisions with you for the journey. Go and meet them and say, We are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses as food on the day that we left to come to you. But take a look, it is now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, but look, they are cracked. And these clothes and sandals of ours are worn out from the extremely long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's counsel. So Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty to live, let them live, and the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. Three days after making the treaty with them, they heard that the Gibeonites were their neighbors living among them. So the, so the Israelites set out and reached the Gibeonite cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chephirah, Beeroth, and kiriath Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the community had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then the whole community grumbled against the leaders. All the leaders answered them, We have sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This is how we will treat them. We will let them live so that no wrath will fall on us because of the oath we swore to them. They also said, Let them live. So the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community as the leaders had promised them. Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, why did you deceive us by telling us you live far away from us when in fact you live among us? Therefore you are cursed and will always be slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. The Gibeonites answered him, it was clearly reported to your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. We greatly feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. Now we are in your hands. Do to us whatever you think is right. This is what Joshua did to them. He delivered them from the hands of the Israelites, and they did not kill them. On that day, he made them woodcutters and water carriers, as they are today, for their community and for the Lord's altar at the place he would choose. It's a great story. It's very interesting of how Satan has a subtle strategy. We see it played out here, and I think you'll see it played out in your life as well. Number one, the first step or part of the strategy that Satan uses is consolidation. Consolidation. Israel victories were produced or did produce a concerted attack. Their enemies had consolidated. They put aside their tribal warfare, their petty squabbles, and secondary issues, all in an effort to fight Israel. Now, every victory a Christian wins in his own personal life is an invitation for the enemy to consult his forces and attack you. If you make a commitment to Christ, that is the day that that battle begins. And whenever you get serious in your walk with God, Satan is going to do all that he can to keep you from following God's will and accomplishing God's purpose. He does not want to see God's name glorified, and he doesn't want to see any kind of victory in your life that would point to the glory of God. Now, what we find is that our blessings, if we watch carefully, our blessings and our battles go hand in hand. If you really stop and think about it, 
blessings cannot come to us apart from conflict. It wouldn't be a blessing. We would not recognize it as a blessing. Why am I able to acknowledge that this was a blessing from God? Because of the conflict from the battle, from the discouragement, from the lack of need that I have in my life. Then I realize that the blessing comes. So think about the battle that you're in. The blessing is coming. There's a blessing in the battle. If you're being tempted on all sides, it's a good sign. It means that you're following God's will. You're on that road to blessing. However, if you say to yourself, I really don't feel much of a battle in my Christian life. You know, things are going really well in my life. Well, of course, God wants to bless you. and He wants things to go well in your life. But that's a dangerous sign. If it's been a while, if it's been years that you've experienced conflict in your life, because of your commitment to Christ and your attempt to follow God's will, to do what is right. Here we see the point is that Satan has consolidated his forces, and he does that in our lives as well. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be consolidated instead of wasting time in tribal warfare, petty squabbles, and secondary issues, most of which make no eternal difference whatsoever. All of hell rejoices when we get bogged down in the minor issues. Nothing less than a full-scale united attack by all the people of God is going to give victory for the church and our culture. This is an extremely timely word once again. Isn't it interesting how relevant Joshua, his experience, the lessons that we're learning are to what we're experiencing not only personally, but in our culture as well. And what I'm afraid is that the church has become anemic and we are not being effective as a counterculture to what we're experiencing. Not to be mean, not to be ugly, but to deliver people from the bondage of Satan. That's the issue where they need to experience the blessing of God, the victory of God in their life. So number one is consolidation. Number two is compromise. Israel forms an alliance with the Gibeonites. Before there was this all-out attack, the Gibeonites deceived Israel. Notice the subtle move that they made. First of all, they looked like they traveled a long way. It's interesting how descriptive God is in his word about the way that they looked. But it was part of the strategy. It's part of Satan's strategy. They looked like they traveled a long way. They said nothing about the defeats at Jericho and at Ai, or at Ai, and then what happened as a result. Otherwise, Israel would have figured out they didn't travel a long way. They're right here around us. And third, they showed respect for Israel's God. They said enough to make them believe that they honored God when, in fact, they did not. Now, this is typical of how the enemy works. He doesn't attack a committed Christian openly. He's not going to ask you to do things that you would know. There's no way I'm going to do that. For those who are fully committed in your walk with Christ, he's going to operate in a very subtle way that's going to pull you down. He has us consider a possible alliance that appears to be insignificant compared to our commitment to Christ. He challenges us about our allegiance to Christ. Now, how does he do that? A couple of ways. Satan warns us of the danger of overdoing it. Of overdoing it. Well, you you, you don't want to do that much for the kingdom of God. You don't want to be that serious about the kingdom of God. You're giving too much time to the church and to the kingdom of God. Now, that's one of the ways that he'll deceive us. Secondly, He warns us of the danger of becoming too narrow. Again, this really speaks to where we are in our world today. If you are a committed follower of Jesus Christ, you're serious about what the Bible says, you believe what the Bible says, you believe what it says about every issue, social issue that there is in our world today, you're, you're going to have a lot of labels next to your name that are not complimentary of your Christian faith, right? That's what's going to happen. 
This is so serious that on August 23rd, I'm going to start a series as we look at those things that we believe and what we ought to believe, what the Bible says about the essential foundational values of our life. Because I believe, again, that the church is not clear in its message about what we believe. We talk about what we're against, but what are we for? What are, what's the good that, that we ought to be teaching that is going to help people? And again, people will look at that and they will say, well, you, you're too narrow-minded. But again, we've got to get back to the basics of what we believe in order to be effective as the church of Jesus Christ in helping people in the culture that they're listed. They, you know, it's just so discouraging, is it not? As we watch the news and we see what's happening in America and we see people who are absolutely lost within themselves. They have no idea of who they are. They have no idea why they're here. They have no idea of where their life ought to go. Satan has totally deceived them in thinking that the path they're on is going to lead to life. When Jesus said, it is a broad road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. So yeah, we're going to be accused of narrow thinking, being narrow-minded people. Because we're on a narrow path that does lead to life. And so God is going to help us, I believe, in the months to come, really help us understand what that road that leads to life looks like. All right, August 23rd is when that will start. Satan also will lead us to believe that a portion of our time and energy ought to be reserved for us. Now, there's a balance in the way that we live, but what does that really mean, time and energy reserved for us? You know, I believe that every waking moment of our life is dedicated to God. Everything that happens in our life is connected to God. Now, I, I think sometimes it's easy to compartmentalize our lives and to say, this part I give to God this part is for me. This part is for my career. This part is for my family. When God is woven into every fabric of every compartment of your life. And so it's very easy to listen to Satan as he says to us, Oh, you, you deserve this. Time out from God. You, you, you can do this. We begin to form alliances and we make compromises that seem insignificant, but they cause us to lose our edge. He is out to steal our affection, to lower our standard of commitment, and to cause us to compromise even just a little bit. The third aspect of his subtle strategy is common sense. It seemed logical for Israel to make an alliance with the Gibeonites. Hey, this is no threat. Look at these guys. They look terrible. They have nothing. Let, let, let's give them a break. We'll make an alliance. We'll make a treaty with them. Satan has caused us to believe that we need common sense in the church versus faith. Now, let me pause here unless I've been misunderstood. God has given us common sense. He's given us reasonable faith. But what I'm talking about here is that we forfeit faith at the expense of common sense. What looks logical to us often is exactly the wrong thing. That, that we, we need to stop and, and evaluate what it is that's before us. What looks like common sense. And to realize that no, this is what God wants us to do over here. Which is going to take a great step of faith. Because it doesn't seem logical to what we think we should do. He has said that we must be practical, Satan has, in our personal affairs. He has said that faith is irrational, <clears throat> that it doesn't make sense. Satan is offering to help us with his power to subtly accomplish our ruin. John writes this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to determine if they are from God. You see what? might make sense to us could lead to our destruction so 
It's not wrong to have common sense. Hear me. But we need to test that spirit and to make sure that it's what God is leading us to do. And God may say, that's exactly what you ought to do. Isn't it obvious? He may say that. But he may say, that seems obvious. But that's not the right step at this time. This is the step that you need to take. Notice also complacency. Another aspect of this. Now listen to what God says. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's counsel. Now what happened? They were complacent in their prayer life. You know, I believe the book of Joshua, in the book of Joshua, this is a major theme about prayerlessness. We talked about that last week. And here we see it again. They did not seek the Lord's counsel. They thought they were doing the right thing, but they didn't stop and ask God, is this the right thing? It seems to take us a long time to learn what happens when we don't pray. And the trouble that we get into, which prevents us from discerning God's will and discerning Satan's tricks, his deceit. The voice of the hireling sounds like the voice of the shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice. Sometimes we hear another voice. It's not the shepherd. How many of us discover that the things which seem to be, which seem not to matter at the time, wasn't that important, have hurt us? The power has been cut from our life because we gave Satan just one inch. Just a small foothold. Now, how can we fight Satan's strategy? We can never, never trust our own judgment about anything. We have to seek the Lord. Someone may say, Pastor, all that you've said today is true of me. I've made allegiances. I've made compromises. I'm suffering. I have suffered. It's too late for me. Well, listen, that's a lie from Satan himself. It's another part of his strategy. It's a lie. What happened with Israel's alliance? We may yield at times to Satan's subtle strategy, but it doesn't mean we've lost the war. Notice what God did. The Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers. Now, what does that mean? It's very interesting, isn't it? It does not mean that they became woodcutters so that they would go out and cut wood so the Israelites would have Uh, fuel to burn fire for uh, cooking a meal to feed themselves they weren't carrying water so that the Israelites would have water to drink for themselves personally notice what the Bible says they were woodcutters and water carriers for the house of God the wood they cut was for the altar of God so the children of Israel could go and worship God They wouldn't spend their time cutting wood for the altar. They would come and worship God. It drove them to worship God. The water that was used that the the Gibeonites carried was to purify themselves, the Israelites, to wash themselves before they worshiped God at the tabernacle, at the tent of meeting. So what seemed to be a bad thing that was taking place became a blessing to the children of Israel. It led them to a place to worship God. What we think is a mistake, what we think is a compromise or an allegiance, if we handle it properly, redemptively, God uses it to bring blessing in our life. That's why Romans 8, 28 is right. It's true that regardless of what we face in life, God brings good out of it satan has made us conclude it's over but god has said just the opposite when jesus died on the cross satan convinced the world it's over but god said my son rise it was not the end but there came victory over sin and death over your sin over your allegiances over your compromises so that God would give you a second chance. And God would allow you to experience the blessing 
that he has in the midst of the trouble. So we refuse to let the devil to drag us down and to keep us down. We forget the things that are behind us and we press on to the things that are ahead. It is not too late. Don't listen to Satan's conclusion. Listen to God's conclusion. What is that? Number one, you are in a battle because you have an enemy. It's predictable. He's very subtle in how he's trying to undo you and how to defeat you and to shame God's name. Secondly, you are on the right team. This is what God's conclusion is. If you're a committed follower of Jesus Christ, you're part of the body of Christ, the church. And so God has a part for you in the church. You're a valued member of the team. That's God's conclusion. But you also have a critical part on the team. And it is a critical hour for you to do everything that you can to fulfill the part that you have. There's too much at stake for you personally. There's too much at stake for the kingdom of God not to do your part. Also, God will bring good out of your battle. You're on the road to blessing. And finally, God has won the battle. You can too. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? There might be somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I realize that I do not have a relationship with God. I recognize that my sin has separated me from a holy God. And I desire today to come to Christ. And you may not know exactly how to do that, what you should do, but God uh, will help you do that. We'll help you. We know what to ask and how to help you make this commitment to Christ. But I also believe there are many in this room who know the Lord, but you're in the battle right now. And it's discouraging. It's hard. You know, it's, it's a, we're all in it in some form or fashion. But I don't want you to lose heart. Although Satan has a subtle strategy, God has a strategy to help you win and to help you experience his blessing, to help you experience an abundant life, a fulfilling life, not a defeated life, not a wandering life, not a hopeless life, but a life that will bring meaning and purpose to your life. God may be leading some of you to become part of our church family, to be part of a local church, a local body of Christ, as we need each other in this battle that we're all part of his army. And uh, we value that, and we want you to be a part of what God is doing here at Linwood and through Linwood. There might be others of you who need to come and pray at the altar. You just need time alone before the Lord. Or maybe you want someone to pray for you. You come and we'll pray with you. God, thank you for speaking to our hearts today through your word. Thank you for the power of your word, the truth of it. God, I pray that you'll help us yield to that truth, to be obedient to that truth, and to experience your blessing in our lives. God, I especially pray for that person who's discouraged right now, who's really in the thick of it. Help them to be discerning of Satan, of his lies, his subtlety. Help them to see your light. Help them to see your path that leads to hope and to victory. God, I pray that you'll help these who need to make commitments now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.